Hello, everybody. Welcome to the testing automation mini-conf. Uh, as you might be able to tell by the sound of the words coming out of my mouth, I'm not from around here. Uh, this is my first LCA, and this is my first organization of the testing automation mini-conf, so I'm glad you all could join. Uh, we've got some really good talks today, uh, and I don't want to bore you with any silliness from me, so I'd like to introduce Matt, who's going to talk about QA in the open. Please welcome Matt. <laughs> So um, I'm Matt Trinish, and I'm going to be talking about QA in the open, um, specifically how we do QA in the open in the OpenStack community. A little bit about myself, I was the, I've been working in the OpenStack project since 2012, and I was the former project team lead of the QA effort in the community, and I'm also currently serving on the technical committee for OpenStack, which is the governance oversight, and I think X just died on my lap, nope, okay. <laughs> Uh, that happened earlier. Um, and I do apologize if I yawn at all. It's a little jet lag from New York. It's, <laughs> it's a long way. Um, so let's just dive into it. So to start, what am I talking about when I talk about open source QA? It's basically any open source software, the same ideals and the same fundamentals and how you operate your project, but doing it with QA. So doing it with testing, test plans, um, the systems with which you test, and um, how you share the results. And a critical component of that is making sure that the tests run in the open. So whether it's on dedicated hardware that you own and have publicly accessible, or if it's on donated resources. In the OpenStack community, we're very um, lucky that we have a lot of generous uh, donors for our uh, nonprofit foundation around the software that also happen to run clouds, because OpenStack is about making clouds. And so we have a lot of cloud resources we can leverage for running tests and hosting the results in public. That's the other aspect of doing QA in the open that's often overlooked is that besides running the test in the open, you want the results to be um, accessible to everyone so they can look at them and compare them and independently reproduce them locally. Um, yep, and yeah, just treat, treat QA like open source project. Um, now, I'm sure everyone has dealt with enterprise QA at a company, and I don't mean to offend anyone who works in enterprise QA. Um, in my experience, I've worked at uh, two large companies, both IBM and HP, and they're very traditional engineering organizations. They treat their, uh, their software QA like they treat traditional engineering QA, where you have a team that makes a doodad. It's a black box. You send it to your QA team. They sit there and they poke the black box with very complicated inputs or whatever they can come up with, and they tell you when something unexpected happens. And that's the extent of the QA. Um, that doesn't really work in, I mean, it works in software, but you can do it better in software because software isn't a black box, especially open source software, it's not a black box. You want to be, a, you have access to all of the internals and the workings and you can do a better job of testing it, taking it apart, seeing where things go wrong and provide better testing and better quality for the, uh, end result. So just to talk a bit about what OpenStack QA is before I get into the history around how it evolved over time. Um, OpenStack QA is a team in the OpenStack community that has the mission statement to develop, maintain, and initiate tools and plans to ensure the upstream stability and quality of OpenStack and its release readiness at any point during the release cycle. That basically just means we own uh, test suites and helping other projects uh, own their own QA and own their own testing. Um, so that when we push a release at any point, um, even though it's a fixed six month release cycle, um, that we can guarantee that everything is well tested and working. What that ends up being is a whole lot of projects and there might be even more now. I forgot to check. Um, but this you know, covers a wide gamut of different things. Um, the projects that have DevStack in the front, those are related to uh, dev test deployment. So OpenStack is a big, complicated project. DevStack is there for developers to quickly spin up an OpenStack environment that runs a real cloud that they can poke at and um, you know, look at how it runs, see how their changes interact with the rest of the cloud and the rest of the ecosystem. Um, Grenade is upgrade testing. Uh, Tempest and all of the things listed there for Tempest, those are integration test suites to do black box API testing from a running OpenStack cloud. Um, then you've got some things like bash hate and hacking, which are style rules, style checking. Um, the bash hate is an interesting one because we called it bash eight originally. Um, 
like uh, I'm sure people are familiar with PEP8 in Python or Flake8 in Python. Um, but we got some pushback from the Debian community because what happens if there's a bash version 8? Um, so we changed it to bash8, um, which you should pronounce as bash8, but I prefer bash8. Um, there's also JavaScript style rule checking, just to ensure that code style is consistent between projects. That also falls under the mission of uh, OpenStack QA. And then there are some other tools there. Uh, OS Tester is a test runner. Um, OS Performance Tools does some performance metric gathering. And then there are some dashboard tools and other tools to visualize test results to make it easier to analyze all of this testing we're doing in the open. Um, how do we do that testing? Um, this isn't actually part of the QA in OpenStack. This is run by the OpenStack infrastructure team. But it's important to understand how OpenStack does testing in the open to understand how QA is leveraged in the community. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, um, you pull your, if you, if you want to develop on OpenStack, you get cloned from one of the Git repositories. In this case, I use Nova as an example. You clone Nova to your local environment. You branch it. You make your whatever changes. Hopefully, you run your t unit tests locally and whatever other testing locally. Um, you commit the change, and you push it up with Git review to Garrett, which we use for code review in the community. Um, as soon as you push it to Garrett, it spins off automated testing. And depending on the project, it can be a lot of automated testing. Uh, for example, one project I work on spins up about 25 to 35 test jobs, um, which is each running on its own VM um, in a donated cloud. Um, those tests run and report back. If the tests don't pass, Jenkins will return minus one in Garrett, and it will block the merge. Um, once, and you iterate on this by git commit, amend, and review, and once you get the plus one from Jenkins and approval from two core reviewers, um, the tests will spin up again a final time to make sure that nothing has changed, nothing is bit rot between the repository of when you pushed the patch originally and when it was approved. And assuming it passes that final round of testing, it'll be merged. Um, and we generate a lot of data during those tests uh, that are run. Um, and yeah, that's the basic workflow. And as I was saying, a lot of work gets pushed, or a lot of work gets done just from the simple act of I want a pull request in GitHub, or well, it's not GitHub, but the same, same concept. Um, the, just a proposed check spins off a whole ton of work. Um, those DevStack Tempest runs, those are big VMs with uh, four cores and eight gigs of RAM at a minimum. Some of them are even bigger. Um, and they run thousands of tests, and Grenade does the same thing, and then style rule checkers and unit tests, and they're all running. Um, it can take some time, um, but it's uh, just important to realize how that all works together. And this is just a snapshot from uh, what, what is going on during the test system Actually, that was a pretty light day. Uh, but you can see all of the test jobs that are running. Um, and you know, success, failure, I think, I think there's, there's a few failures in there. Um, and you can see the different, uh, the different uh, phases of the testing. The check side on the left is where tests are being run from the initial push. And the gate in the center is where the final pre-merge check is being run. And with this system, we can ensure that everything passes the test before it merges which is um, important, it, and it helps uh, ensure that there's a sense of uh, confidence in both the users and the developers that things work when we on master at any given point. So when we push a release, it's going to work. So a little bit about, I'm going to uh, explain the history of how QA and OpenStack evolved over time. Um, and hopefully I can do it without going too much into the nitty gritty details of OpenStack governance and politics in a large multi-corporate open source project. Um, so when OpenStack was started back in 2010, 2011, um, every project had unit tests. Some projects had functional tests. Testing was central to the OpenStack culture um, because a lot of the people that started working on OpenStack originally had worked on the Drizzle project um, when it was at MySQL, and they had adopted a similar workflow to the, C the CI workflow I was showing earlier. Um, and when OpenStack was uh, becoming open source, they said, we want the same workflow because it's proven useful in, other, in our previous experience. So they made sure that testing was central to the OpenStack culture. Um, 
But there was no dedicated QA effort or testing effort. It was just ad hoc. As you push changes, you would, you know, maybe you'd add unit tests, maybe you wouldn't. Um, then there was an effort to start the Tempest project. As I said earlier, Tempest is the um, integration test suite for the OpenStack community. It runs black box API testing against a running cloud um, to verify that all of the APIs work and do the right thing. Um, and this was the first dedicated QA project in the OpenStack community. And it was the start of what would end up becoming the QA community. But back then, it was just uh, an unofficial project uh, kind of in the background. Over the next two years, um, QA evolved into a separate project. The team that was working on Tempest and DevStack and Grenade and testing in the community uh, slowly coalesced into a team. And it started with just two projects, Tempest and Grenade. Um, and slowly over time, it started pulling in more and more projects um, to get where you saw that list earlier. Um, this was about, I want to say, 2013 time frame. Um, so it's all actually happened pretty quickly, because OpenStack isn't that old of a project. Um, the other thing that's important here is that at this point, Tempest was an integral part of that CI workflow. For all of the projects, the Tempest was required to pass before any change could land, which helped at making QA a defined group. Oops. Um, so once QA became a defined group, we had started writing some policies about how testing should work in OpenStack to fulfill that mission statement. Um, the first thing we did was OpenStack is a big ecosystem with a lot of projects. Um, QA was kind of a small team. So we said, OK, we'll own testing for integrated and incubated projects, which in the OpenStack community back then were projects that were officially OpenStack projects or projects that were on the road to soon become an OpenStack project. They have some last minute requirements, and then they graduate and become part of OpenStack. Um, and we said, OK, that's a containable set. We'll, we'll test those projects for them. We'll do the Tempest testing and some other testing, and we'll own all of that for them. Um, this is actually pretty similar to the, the facepalm monkey picture with the Enterprise QA. It's a separate team. We poke the black box externally and see if the test results worked out OK. Um, and back then, Tempest, uh, Tempest tests and unit tests were basically all that we did. Um, and all of these projects would share one gate queue. So it's um, kind of hard to describe abstractly in words. I should put a picture in here. I'll make a note for that in the future. Um, but it's basically that um, that queue, um, they're all, let me go back. All of those projects, you see that vertical line between the uh, projects in the gate queue? Those are all Nova, but then there's DevStack at the bottom. It basically means they're speculatively um, running tests, assuming the projects in front of them merge. So when I say cogate, I mean that um, all of the projects um, run in the same queue, and they can't merge without the tests in front of them passing. So all of the projects in OpenStack ran together, and they had reciprocal testing. Um, while we were defining this and you know working on tests, the OpenStack project um, this is a lot of money in the community, and a lot of companies are excited about cloud computing. Um, the community was growing. The number of projects that were in OpenStack were growing pretty rapidly. I mean, you can see that time frame. That's six years. And it went from being maybe four or five projects from 2013, when QA was started, to however many are on there. I can't count the same goal. It's a couple dozen, maybe. Um, and the QA team wasn't really growing that much, but OpenStack was. And OpenStack was also having growing pains uh, related to the amount of projects that were coming in. Um, oh, and the color coding here, I realize there's no index. Um, blue means integrated projects, green mean incubated, and yellow mean just a project that's not in either. Um, so the QA community was um, responsible for testing blue and green, uh, not yellow. So as I was saying, the core review team on the QA projects was very small. Um, it's less than 10. But we were basically responsible for owning the testing, uh, or at least the black box API testing for all of those projects. Uh, we didn't really scale. 
Um, also, the QA community had limited expertise on newer projects. I see Steve in the front row. We had some interesting community discussions around his, the project he works on, Heat, because um, a lot of the QA cores didn't have a lot of expertise on Heat, and there was a lot of friction around that. Um, and a lot of times, uh, some project teams weren't motivated to contribute to QA projects directly. Um, there was some friction because uh, some of the coding style was different, some of the values were different. Um, you know, that was, things were reaching a breaking point. And a really good way to visualize this is this really aliased graph. Um, I don't know why the lines came out so aliased, but um, these are all of the projects that were uh, incubated or integrated over those really, uh, any time during those release cycles. And it's the, just the number of tests in the Tempest project for each of those projects. You can see Nova, which is um, one of the key projects in OpenStack that does VMs, um, has a lot of tests. And some of the other earlier projects have a lot of tests. But most of them just stay at the bottom. And that's because we didn't get contributions externally, and the, the internal teams for these projects, they couldn't grow. We couldn't scale with the rate of change in an open source project as big as OpenStack. Um, this is a really good way, I think, to visualize how um, we were having scaling problems in the community. And while all of this was happening in QA, larger in OpenStack, um, they were also, we were also feeling pains related to the growth. Um, so the technical committee at the time decided to restructure the community. Instead of having incubated and integrated projects, there would be a larger ecosystem around OpenStack. Uh, this was called the Big Tent. Uh, it's still the current um, governance model for the OpenStack community. Um, basically just meant um, we're asking if a project fulfills the OpenStack mission statement, um, which I don't have off the top of my head, um, and whether it um, conforms to the community values and it helps push the open source cloud ecosystem forward. Um, what this basically meant for QA um, is the tent's on fire, because if you remember earlier, QA said, okay, we'll own all of the testing for incubated and integrated projects. Well, the Technical committee just threw that out. That doesn't exist anymore. So what's QA going to do? Um, we had to figure out what our solution for the for testing in an open in an OpenStack community that was much larger. Uh, it went from being those you know dozen or two projects to I think currently there are 61 OpenStack projects and over 400 repositories. Um, definitely couldn't own testing all of that. So what we decided to do. Um, was still directly support the base infrastructure as a service projects. So OpenStack builds a cloud ecosystem, and there are some projects that build the base infrastructure as a service cloud to allocate networks, storage volumes, um, VMs, things like that. And we still wanted to own uh, black box testing for that because of how critical it was to ensure that that base is still working for all of the higher level services that do things like pass or orchestration. Um, if you didn't have a stable API for the core services, then when things are built up higher in the stack, they won't work. Um, for all of the other projects, um, we wanted a more self-service model and provide plugin interfaces and stable APIs for those projects to own their own testing and provide guidelines and recommendations for how to do testing in a better way. And this much better fit the growth of OpenStack and the growth of projects. And at the same time, it also kind of conforms to an open source philosophy, um, at least in my head, a little bit better, because you're free to do whatever you want. We provide you, we provide you recommendations and ways to do things, but you're on your own to do it that way, and you can um, do it if you want or not do it, and that will reflect in the end result. Um, so in the process of introducing plugin interfaces, we had to reorganize and re-architect some of our projects so they actually had stable interfaces. A lot of what we were doing in the QA community, especially for some of the testing projects, was pretty ad hoc and changed rapidly internally. And if anyone tried to depend on it externally, they'd break all of the time. Um, but it took, it took a couple of, uh, probably took a year, year and a half. But we finally were able to re-architect the projects so they all had stable interfaces internally that could be depended on it externally by other projects, and they had plugin interfaces. Um, right now, 
the big projects that have plugin interfaces that are used by most of the OpenStack projects are DevStack to, um, to deploy dev test environments for OpenStack, Tempest to do black box API testing, and Grenade to test upgrades. And all three of those support modular. They have modular, stable interfaces that also allow plugins so that they can integrate into one big test suite or one big upgrade test or one big dev test deploy environment. Um, so what did we learn from uh, the switch? Well, the first thing is that graph right there. That shows the number of plugins in the OpenStack projects over time. Uh, you can see when we introduced each plugin, and you can see how rapidly they grew. DevStack, since everyone needs to be able to deploy their project to test it and use it um, as a developer, that one has the most traction. And you can see it's almost at 140 plugins, and it's been, it'll be a year. Um, or two years in February. Um, Tempest, it's also growing pretty quickly, but not as quickly because um, I guess most people don't care about black box testing their API. <laughs> um, but it, it's also a little bit more involved to get that working. And Grenade, not exactly sure what's going on with Grenade. Uh, I guess people don't like to test that their projects can upgrade between releases. Um, yeah, so Grenade didn't really catch on as much. but. The other projects, they seem to be growing pretty rapidly. And I use that as evidence that the switch from you know, separate and monolithic to a plug-in and self-service in open source works much better. Um, the other thing I learned, uh, and I think as a community we learned, is that keeping things separate increases friction. Um, it goes back to the, you know, the enterprise QA, where the, you know, traditional engineering, the black box, they have huge QA organizations. I know at IBM, my current employer, they software testing and engineering testing occupies huge facilities. Um, and an open source community can't scale like that to keep things separate, keep the testing separate. So making sure that we integrate testing into a community, make sure that we can do quality assurance in the open. Um, and that was the key takeaway, that none of this would have been possible in OpenStack if we didn't integrate testing early on into the community culture and make it integral to how we do development in OpenStack is that make sure we have testing for everything. And you know, there's friction on how we do it and the methodologies used, but it's, um, it's been important that we, it, to, to, that we were able to have the level of testing and quality that we have in the OpenStack project was part of that just initial testing is important philosophy in the community. So just to make some uh, baseless generalizations about QA in the open from my experience in OpenStack alone, um, some of the advantages of doing QA in the open um, is that it allows external auditing of tests. Um, for an open source project that doesn't have this and doesn't have its own testing, it's up to users or um, other consumers of open source software to own the testing. And that doesn't necessarily mean that users can see the results of the tests and see whether you know, things actually work. It's, um, there's no confidence in the project from anyone. Um, and that's why, you know, things like the Linux kernel, which don't have the same level of uh, testing in the open and public test results, rely on things like distributions to, um, or at least I, I, I feel that way at least, uh, that they rely on distributions to ensure that things work and provide support. Um, it also enables independently repeatable testing to verify that um, if you're making changes to anything, whether that's part of OpenStack or you're you know, downstream forking it for whatever reason, um, that you can repeat all of the testing to make sure that things still work the same way. And all of the components that we're using in OpenStack are reusable. So if you, know, you start another open source project and you want to test in a similar way that OpenStack does, everything that we've built is open source. Um, and you can reuse yourself. And I mean, these are normally the, the normal advantages of just open source in general, all of these things um, you get with open source software, but people don't often think about it from the testing side. Um, some of the potential issues you'll hit, though, if you start doing QA in the open, um, a lack of corporate contribution. Going back to what I was saying about distros with the Linux kernel, um, a lot of corporate sponsors that work on open source software don't like to contribute to the testing space. Um, 
My theory is because that's how they differentiate themselves in the market. You say, oh, you buy open source software from us. We, you know, we burn and test it. We make sure there's quality there. And they don't necessarily want to contribute upstream. I know a couple of companies that have huge open source QA efforts, and they very rarely contribute to the, the community ones. Um, and when they come to talk to us, they don't want to adopt to the community um, culture around contribution. They just want to throw things over the fence. Um, Another one that's starting to change is that there's limited free resources for running tests. So the OpenStack community, as I said earlier, is very lucky that we have a lot of corporate money involved in the community, and most of that corporate money involves cloud providers because we're in the business of making cloud software. Um, with things like Travis CI and other, thing, and other services like that, it's um, getting to be less restrictive around running tests in the open. But that, that is a potential issue, especially for smaller projects. Um, and sometimes there's difficulty getting community buy-in, um, especially if there's not a testing first mentality in your open source community. Um, but even in OpenStack where testing comes first, we have a hard time sometimes uh, convincing other projects that they need to be testing in a certain way or that there's you know, advantages to doing black box API testing that's independent of releases or things like that. And there's always going to be friction because everyone fights doing something if they don't want to. Um, so, yeah. Those are at least the potential issues I've seen, and I'm sure there are others um, for people who are also doing this. Um, so that was all I had for really prepared material. Um, there, here are some sources to get more information. We've got a wiki page, like everyone. Um, it's the OpenStack dev mailing list, and then all of the QA development in the community happens on Freenode IRC um, at the OpenStack QA channel. So with that, I don't know how quickly I went through that, probably a bit too quickly, yeah. Um, but there's plenty of time for questions, so. <laughs> and there's a question up here. I was, at, they didn't want to run the mics around, so I'll try to repeat the questions on the mic, or Tyler will, and um, just make sure the question's in the form of a question. Okay. Um, I'm interested to see that. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so, interested to know whether you've got any corporate pushback, or, you know, pushback from the corporate um, contributors for publishing the tests and test results in the open, um, and where you see the progress on some of those issues, try, especially trying to get the corporate or the, the um, companies involved to contribute more resources and to contribute to the, the open testing. OK. Um, so for the first half of the question, which was pushback from companies willing to publish open test result data, um, yes, there at least initially. Um, so part of the community testing infrastructure that I uh, was showing in the slides, um, all of the software that runs in that has to be open source. So proprietary corporate things weren't ever run as that. Um, but there is the infrastructure in place for them to run their own testing. Um, and a lot of them didn't want to do that at first. Um, and part of it was competitive, like uh, especially for some of the things like storage vendors. They didn't want to say, oh, my, store, my SAN array was much slower than our competitors. They didn't want, us, they didn't want those kind of results published. Um, the way we worked around that was requiring it. Um, if you, had, if you wanted a driver for your SAN array or if you wanted a driver for your big networking switch, we said you had to run tests with open results that report to the, the Garrett review system. And that way, as developers of these projects, we can say, OK, yeah, the tests work. And the results are open for everyone. Um, and the vendors that didn't do that had their, dri their drivers and support for their products dropped. Um, for things that weren't proprietary vendor drivers, um, they didn't really have a choice because all of the code for the project um, runs in the open. If they're doing additional testing on the side, they don't, almost, I don't think anyone publishes results for non, for non open testing from like vendor side. Okay. Um, as 
OpenStack has grown. You all have built a lot of software. And as yeah. OpenStack's QA's project grown, you've built a lot of software. I'm curious what the, the testing of the testing software <laughs> looks like and how far down that line goes um, for OpenStack QA. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And that's something I suck at. Because as ironic as it is that I was the QA PTL for two years, um, I'm terrible at writing tests. And I'm terrible at testing my own code. Um, but so that's something, a lot of it is self-testing in that we, um, the tests don't work. They fail, and everyone breaks. Um, but we've started building up unit testing and other testing frameworks inside of the projects to make sure that they're working properly, especially as part of that plugin decomposition um, when we were making sure we had stable interfaces for all of the projects so that anyone could consume them. Part of that was testing to make sure those interfaces were stable and worked. Um, I won't say it's perfect, but uh, <laughs> but we've been making progress on that, and that's something at least I've been pushing personally because I've seen all of the edge cases. I know, for example, there was one time in Tempest I pushed a change up to change how we ran tests to make sure they were parallel, and I broke the script so it always returned zero. So the CI system always passed every single test job, even if it failed miserably. Um, and one project managed to land four breaking changes in an hour. Uh, the hour that it took me to catch that I. <laughs> so that was a wake-up call for me to make sure we started testing our changes in the QA community more thoroughly. There's a question back there. Hey, you mentioned community buy-in before. Could you expand on how you got past that problem, either by um, getting buy-in or at least compliance? Um, it's a constant fight. I, I wouldn't say we've gotten around it necessarily. Like I know, for example, right before I gave this presentation on the mailing list, I'm in a, the middle of a fight that's uh, about, to get a little more technical than I was expecting in the talk, but Tempest tests are branchless um, to make sure that the API is consistent across release boundaries so we don't branch at releases. Um, and I'm having to fight for projects that use Tempest plugins to also be branchless. Um, you know, it's consistent with, you know, how Tempest is releases, so the plugin should be branchless, and also the, just the generic advantage of making sure that the tests are independent of a specific version of the software, and you're actually testing the API, which is supposed to be consistent. Um, and I'm getting a lot of pushback on that. <laughs> it's just a constant fight to you know, show, your, show your right. Someone's wrong on the internet. You have to. <laughs> if, if you'll actually indulge me in another question, uh, I'm very curious what you think the OpenStack QA project has messed up the most to where if you were to start clean, how you would change that moving forward? Because this is like a five or six year old project now, right? Yeah, that's, uh, it's slowly evolved over time. And that's, that's a good question that I haven't thought about because I've just been kind of caught up in the, you know, caught up in the wind and going with the flow of things. Um, I think we would have started with the modular approach. And I think we would have started with stronger guidelines um, and better documentation on the approach to take to testing in general. Um, part of the problem is when QA started, OpenStack was also a young project and um, didn't necessarily have strong opinions on certain things, uh, like API stability. And th as Tempest and other testing and the OpenStack QA community evolved, that was in response to the OpenStack project maturing. And I think now that we're at the end point, I think some of the end state we've reached about, you know, this is how you test APIs to make sure they're stable across release. I think we should have documented that clearly at the start of the project um, and actually just started everything earlier. <laughs> no, I know that's not a good answer, but. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if there's nothing else, I'll be around, so.